All right, my good friends, uh, this is Mr. Davis. Uh, it's good news, bad news is uh, this will probably be the last time you hear my voice for a while. So I guess this is the good news. The bad news is you might hear my voice for a longer period tonight. Um, really, the only uh, homework is to uh, watch this lesson. Now, this is uh, Thursday night at like nine o'clock so basically watching this lesson will be due um monday at nine o'clock which i know we're like technically you know monday's our last day but that's that's when it's going to be due this isn't going to be too long you just have to go through and answer the questions now um as we uh talk right now they're about to announce officially what the exam is going to be like for um the ap test um at the end of the year, so they're supposed to officially do that tomorrow. They did have a, um, a big conference with teachers and telling them what to expect uh, it might be, and there's a good chance, this is kind of surprising to me, that it might be somewhat of a scaled back uh, DBQ question. That would be the only thing where they give you um, topics and they give you like five documents instead of nine documents, and they give you 45 minutes to write about them. Um, I won't go too much overboard on that. The good thing is we were we wrote one right before we left. Uh, we talked it. We made that made that big uh, chart, that poster with uh, like how to put three points of context, how to answer your question and your thesis statement, make a stance, make an argument. Um, how you talk about each document and some documents that you need to talk about um, the hippo, which was the point of view of the of the author of a document. So we will. I'll know uh, more tomorrow, especially supposed to get specific things, and they might even give us a, a big rubric. But um, so i was a little bit surprised as were a lot of teachers that they would try to uh, squeeze a dbq in just 45 minutes but that's what it seems like it's going to be and uh we'll just go from there and there's some pluses and minuses to that and uh, i think it's something manageable that we can handle um so i'm just going to pause it here and i'm going to let you uh read uh these are two documents I'm um, talking about Song Dynasty in China. So I'm just going to have you pause it and read these documents. Okay, so these are documents about the Chinese civil service exam. So um, if you read something like this, if you got a DBQ about maybe government and like how governments change it, I don't want to get into too much of the DBQ today, but I just want to get you used to um, the reading sources. Again, reading documents, we focus a lot on some short answer questions and multiple choice. So it is good to get used to um, reading paragraphs about what's going on um in history etc so um this talks about a lot about confucianism civil service exams how to keep a large uh country um under yeah in order and not a lot of chaos and they did so with the civil service exam and getting the country to buy into confucianism and the falau piety you know um honoring your mother and your father honoring the the subject honors his ruler, etc. And it was very tough to pass the civil service exam, only about 5%. On um, the book text, we said, said one in five people passed it. This text right here says one in 20 people would have passed a uh, civil service exam. 
So we're talking the best of the best and that the Chinese valued education and they valued having the best people in charge and their dynasties. Oftentimes uh, the way a new dynasty came to power is that they beat the other dynasty, like in a war and warring states, so to speak. And because of that, you had to be pretty, pretty rough and tough uh, group and, not always like the uh, the richest people in the world weren't the ones that were overthrowing the government. It was, you know, maybe your rougher citizens. So those are just good sources. Kind of finishing up the whole topic one about Song China. Um, so you did a spice chart about uh, Dar al Islam. So the Islamic world here. Um, our good friend, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, started uh, Islam down here in the Arabian Peninsula. Born in Mecca, moved to Medina. But when we pick up uh, Islam, it's in the 1200s, and it's the, everything that Islam touches. Now they believe in like a caliphate more than like a s political country. So like this is the caliphate. This is Dar al Islam, and Islam is going to spread. It's going to spread. It's a merchant um, religion. Muhammad was a merchant. Was a phrase we used earlier in the year. Um, so it spreads across. This is the Trans-Saharan uh, trade network. It's going to go across the Indian Ocean trade network. Um, you're going to have the Del Delhi Sultanate that is going to be Muslims who are ruling Hindus in India. Um, and then this outside of this map here, but it's going to go to Southeast Asia, which is the next topic. Um, and they were, um, for the most part, they were traders. They weren't uh, killing one another um, in, in, when they're trading. There was some spots, though, where like in El Alandola, Spain, they do have some battles. Um, and there was a battle in like 732 called the Battle of Tours, where um, in El, Adon El Adala, Spain, where they, they tried to keep growing Islam into Europe, and it, it got stopped right up here. So... But this is the world we're talking about, the uh, Dar al-Islam. Some famous people were Ibn Battuta, uh, Mansa Musa was from Mali, which is down here. Now, Islam in uh, Africa was more in your uh, urban centers where the traders were. Uh, there was not a ton of slides on Islam, so like only like three slides really on this review about Islam. Uh, one thing that you'll see in Islam, if you see any architecture, uh, they, they don't depict uh, the prophet. So a lot of their artwork is calligraphy based and a lot of their artwork comes in more of architecture necessarily than, than paintings or making Persian rugs is another great example of, uh, of Islamic art and Persian rugs. I believe that was from um, uh, the people, the Safavid uh, empire next to the Ottomans. But some famous groups of Muslims was the Mamluk uh, Empire, where Turkish slaves who were working in Egypt to attack and seize control of Egypt, uh, defeated it and, or, and created a Muslim empire. These bad mamajamas down here actually stood up to the um, to the Mongols, and this would be Mamluk, the Mamluk Egyptians down here, and the Mongols came over here. This is Baghdad's like right in here. And so the Mongols keep going and they come down to the Mamluks and the Mamluks turn them back. They're, they're pretty tough. They, they defeated them, the Mongols. Um, this is a Mamluk Sultanate. So Sultanate is oftentimes a, used in various parts of, as a Muslim ruler. The Seljuk Turks, the Muslim Turks who captured parts of the Middle East, including Baghdad. These are going to be after... Uh, uh, well, it's going to be every all this Islamic stuff that we've talked about is um, well after hundreds of years after Muhammad. Now, important to note that Islam, there was a schism after Muhammad's death because they didn't have like a, uh, er, it wasn't like hereditary that like Muhammad's son was going to take over, etc. They had to decide who it was going to be. And they had uh, several hard times deciding who the next caliph was going to be. So Sunni and Shias are the big groups that fight one another. Even to this day, they do not get along. And then there's other like Sufi Muslims that you saw in the 
reading. Uh, Alan Dulles, Spain. So make sure that you remember that uh, Islam goes all the way up into Europe and cl pretty close to France. Muslim empire in Spain that represents tolerance and collaboration between numerous religions and Muslims occupied those territory. Alan Dulles today shows a lot of Muslim influence in both its architecture and art. Now, I, I think these are uh, Arabic names are tough for me to remember. I, I would probably more focus on what they did rather than their names, but it's some of the easy ones like Mansa Musa is not really Arabic, but uh, uh, Ibn Battuta, that is kind of an Arabic name. Um, duh, he's not from Arabia. I'll, to, I'll tell you where he's from in this video. But uh, the names are a little bit hard, or, but, but if you can go just by the last part, Din Tusi, he was an Islamic uh, scholar who made advancements in math that laid the groundwork for trigonometry. Um, and here, it, I'm just going to butcher her name, so I'll just have you read it. But long story short, I wouldn't get caught up on like memorizing these these names. Maybe Ivan Batuta stuff, but you you know remember the House of Wisdom. Um, remember uh, the fact that the um, the Muslims also um, uh, you know were into the sciences, into the medical fields. They had a, um, a canon of medicine. They knew that you needed to wash your hands before you get went to surgery. Something that uh, Europeans and Americans weren't washing their hands going into surgery as late as the 1800s. They had figured that out far before that. So I wouldn't focus on these names. I would focus on their culture and some of their great advancements. Specifically, they're going to have big things in sailing. Um, they're going to be using the astrolabe. They're going to be using the compass. They're going to be using, uh, being able to come up with ships, etc. cetera. Um, so they also take paper from China and put it on a mass scale. So let me just pause this for one second. Okay, let's uh, pick it up here. Uh, what the third topic is South and Southeast Asia. So not a lot of slides here. Uh, so we'll do a little bit of reading um, and before we get to the Americas. But I do want to show you this. This is pretty cool. For, this is Anger Watt. Uh, so let me bring this up and play this for you. In Southeast Asia, an abandoned city sprawls magnificently across the heart of Cambodia. Its hundreds of monuments contain more stone than the Egyptian pyramids and cover more ground than modern Paris. This is Angkor, the capital of an empire that once controlled most of Southeast Asia. Its people were called the Khmer. And more than 500 years ago, they fled this grand city. To the outside world, the city existed only in obscure traveler's tales. Then in 1860, a French naturalist named Henri Mouault stumbled across the ruins. He wrote about the city and drew it, attracting the attention of the wider world. But the questions had only just begun. Who were Angkor's builders, the empire called the Khmer? And why had the city been abandoned? Archaeologists and historians have pieced together the story. Angkor's greatest marvel, Angkor Wat, served as a shrine, an observatory, and a funerary temple. Research suggests that it took almost 30 years to complete and was finished in time to bury an important king. But Angkor Wat had hardly claimed its place on the horizon when disaster struck. Drawn by its increasing splendor, the Champs, from what is now Vietnam, attacked and burned the city. When the capital was rebuilt, the king built a walled city, Angkor Thom, to protect them in time of war. But the Khmer story came to an end not long afterwards. 
22 kings over 500 years had worked the land until it began to fail. Rice harvests dropped and stone monument buildings ceased. Early in the 15th century, the Kingdom of Siam made profitable raids into Khmer territory. A climactic battle around 1431 brought about the end. All but abandoned, the Khmer capital was lulled into a centuries-long sleep by the encroaching jungle. Okay, that's um, Angkor Wat there. Let's look at uh, Southeast Asia here. Um, so, so Southeast to South and Southeast Asia, basically India is South Asia, and then East Asia is China, and then this big region here is the combination of Southeast Asia. We did like a, something back in um, the early part of the year where I gave you guys a kingdom, and you you filled out a chart about their kingdom. Um, we don't need to get that detailed into, into this uh, review about all the different kingdoms. One of the big takeaways for sure is that Islam uh, gets spread into India, and then it gets carried into the Malacca Strait down here. This is the Malacca Strait right here. Uh, also, uh, when we're talking about the spread of... Uh, of religions like Islam, Buddhism had been exported to China, and it's also going to get exported down here. Hinduism is also going to get exported down into this region of the world. So here we have Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, all existing pretty peacefully. The, the Muslims had conquered India with the Delhi Sultanate. Um, the Buddhists had gone into China pretty peacefully for the most part the muslims were also down here but the hindus had also gone down here as well um and, and buddhism was down in southeast asia people uh you got a few uh people joining uh islam uh converting from hinduism to islam and vice versa so long story short all these major religions were down here in this part of the world the one that's not down here is going to be Christianity because that's way up here in Europe at the time. So they had not had the technology to get down here. So uh, the monsoon winds, we read about how they didn't have the technology to sail against the wind. So the harbors uh, provided uh, places for the sailors to have refuge during the wind season, which would keep them in ports. Uh, and that's when the um, religions get spread. Uh, so a lot of coastal towns in the Malacca Strait will become uh, Muslim. And you will also see, um, uh, drawing a blank here, um, you'll see rulers, you hear the term legitimizing their rule. You'll see some rulers just accepting a new religion like Hinduism and then declaring themselves as like gods themselves and building huge monuments and shrines to themselves. Um, so if we could click on this link right here, and if we could just go to this page right here, and I'll get up here eventually. I got it here. Well, it's not the one I wanted. Okay, and if we could take a second and read page, let's see, I think we're in two, if we can read 284 to the bottom of 285 here. I'll ask you a few questions about those first couple of pages, but let's go down now to um, 280. Or 290 now, and let's read 290 and 291 here. Really quick read. Okay, let's uh, put this uh, look at this map here and put this in perspective. This is Champa, which is uh, later. This is going to be Vietnam right here, but Champa, Champa, uh, they're going to be shipping up rice, Champa rice, to the Chinese. 
form of tribute. The Chinese were, uh, you, if you read about how rough the Vietnamese fighters were down here, it says the Viet people fled into the depths of the mountains and forests. It was not possible to fight them. The soldiers were kept in garrisons to watch over abandoned territories. This went on for a long time, and the so soldiers grew weary. Then the Viet came out and attacked. The Chinese suffered a great defeat. The dead and wounded were many. After this, the emperor deported the convicts to hold the garrisons against the Viet people. So basically what they're saying there is that uh, the emperor of China uh, cleared out the prisons, and he wanted the prisoners to go fight the Vietnamese. They find they will eventually conquer them. But um, long story short about Southeast Asia is you don't need to remember all these kingdoms. The big takeaways is that religion is getting exported down here. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. Um, you'll, we'll have to look a little bit more into detail of why, like what makes Hinduism attractive to people, what makes Buddhism attractive to people. Um, Hinduism, the caste system is not very attractive to people. That's hard to go out. Uh, what where you might see Hinduism get some converts is your upper elite who might say, well, I'm already in the highest caste. So that's where you see some rulers in this part of the world becoming Hindu and then building statues and, and making themselves like gods because there's hundreds of gods in the Hindu religion. Whereas um, Buddhism, it's, it's not that. Like Buddhism there's not a reincarnation. You go like Nirvana is like a heaven like um, state. So you, there is a reason why um, some, some rulers uh, join Hinduism because they could kind of deify themselves. Um, and Islam is also attractive to people because it, uh, particularly the, the masses um, who don't have a lot of money aren't in a high caste system in Hindu might join Islam. All right, so um, let's read here, and we're, we're almost done with our reading. But if you just um, read where it says the Malay world, and then, so let's see, we just want to do uh, page 293 to 295, and that'll be all of our really textbook reading. All right, and here is a uh, aerial picture of Angkor Wat, which we watched the video of. Here's some different facts about it. Angkor Wat was originally a Hindu temple, but was taken over by the Buddhists during the 16th century. And you might, with all these different names, you might say, like, where, where exactly is this? And if you go up to this map on page, it would be 291. Here is Angkor. So it was a Hindu temple. Uh, it was like a, it was going to be a burial tomb for one of their kings. And then you see uh, rulers using religion to legitimize their rule, like their gods themselves, like I was talking about. Uh, but then the Buddhists, it said, they, they overtook it. Angkor was while the Hindu universe with the shrine of its hub enclosed by three courtyards and topped by five towers. Um, here it says it overrun by Buddhists in the 16th century, which would be the 1500s, and right smack dab at the beginning of the uh, Age of Exploration. These, these walls are decorated with hundreds of statues and base reliefs showing scenes from ancient Indian stories. Three mile moat surrounds Angkor Wat. That's pretty wild, pretty crazy to go and check that out. Okay, so. Uh, that is Southeast Asia there. So make sure you really focus on this. Uh, don't skip over this 295. A lot of good things about their culture, et cetera, is, is smack dab in there. And I'll ask you a question or two coming up on page 295. But let us now go to Heimler history, and we're going to look at the... Americas, Americas and Africa here. Let me see if this be it. It's not it. Okay. 
apart, and both groups went extinct. All right, let's move down the map to Central America and talk about... Welcome back to Heimler's History. In this video, we're looking at state building and what's generally going on in the Americas and in Africa from 1200 to 1450. And I can see it in your eyes. You're ready. Let's get to it. All right, just for poops and giggles, let's start with America, specifically North America. The first large-scale civilization in North America was the Mississippian culture. And these folks loved mounds. Nope. There it is. They built these huge monumental mounds for religious, ceremonial, and sometimes elite residential purposes. Maybe the most significant of these folks were the Cahokia, who were located in what is now southern Illinois. The Cahokia had a rigid class system, somewhat like the Hindu caste system. Each town had a ruler called the Great Sun, and under the Great Sun were the priests and the nobles, and under the priests and the nobles was everyone else, farmers, hunters, merchants, and artisans. Now, even though the Cahokia enjoyed a vibrant culture, sometime around 1450, the entire settlement was abandoned. And the mysterious part is that nobody really knows why, although historians speculate that it was something like an environmental disaster, maybe like a flood or something. All right, let's go with Chaco and the Mesa Verde. Uh, let me just say something real quick. I don't think like the Cahokia, I don't think that'll be a, a major part of this uh, AP test. So um, I, we won't get too caught up in that. These folks scratched out a living Group. in a very arid and treeless portion. We're going to be focusing on is Aztecs and no the Incas. To build their homes. Instead, they built homes and towns in the side of cliffs out of bricks and other building material. Both of these groups had thriving civilizations for a good long time. But by 1300, the climate got drier and both groups went extinct. All right, let's move down the map to Central America and talk about the Aztecs, or as they're sometimes known, the Mexicas. In 1325, they founded a gargantuan capital city called Tenochtitlan, which was located roughly where current-day Mexico City is located. And this city was magnificent with its ziggurats and its bustling marketplaces. In fact, when Europeans finally set eyes on this city many years later, they were astonished at its beauty. One of the Spaniards who saw it said it this way, When we saw so many cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land, we were amazed and said that it was like the enchantments on account of the great towers and queues and buildings rising from the water and all built of masonry. I do not know how to describe it, seeing things as we did that had never been heard of or seen before, not even dreamed about. Now, from this city center, the Aztecs conquered much of Mesoamerica, and their particular method of state building is worth noting. The Aztecs controlled their subjects by means of a tribute system administered by a local governor. And a tribute was basically a payment that conquered peoples had to pay to the empire for their privilege of remaining conquered. And the tributes collected could be lots of different things like money or land or military service or goods and services. And this arrangement allowed the Aztecs to exercise political dominance over a huge swath of land without being directly and locally involved. Involved. Okay, let's head over to Africa and see what those folks are up to. By 1000, most of the sub-Saharan Africans adopted agriculture, but they did not form centralized governments like a lot of other civilizations did. Rather, they organized themselves into kin-based networks. Each network was led by a chief, and then the groups of villages that were geographically clustered were connected into loose federations. And the chiefs from those regional federations formed councils to solve the region's problems. Now, a great example of this kind of African state building is the House Kingdom. Sometime before 1000, the Hausa ethnic group formed seven states which were connected by kinship ties. Even so, the states had no central authority, but each state specialized. For example, the states that were located in the plains had the climate and the land for farming, so they became the agriculturalists. The westernmost states specialized in military tactics and therefore provided defense for the rest of the states. Furthermore, the Hausa Kingdom benefited tremendously from the Trans-Saharan Trade Network. And as you know, these trade routes brought Muslims into West Africa, and by 1300, the Hausa Kingdom was largely Muslim. And the Hausa Kingdom is a good example of what the rest of the governments were like in Sub-Saharan Africa. In general, where governments existed, they were not centralized, ruling over large portions of land. Instead, they were almost always small communities organized by kinship ties. And culturally, the men were usually found doing the jobs that required skilled labor like blacksmithing, and the women oversaw the farming and the domestic duties at home. And since we're talking about culture, let's talk literature. Literature did exist in African societies during this time, but it was largely oral in nature. One of the most significant members of any African society was the Griots. They were the storytellers who housed within themselves the history and the narratives and the lineage of the tribe to which they belonged. And they had a sort of prophetic type of presence among the people. It was said that a Griot could sing your destruction or your prosperity. All right, that's a quick flyby of what's happening in the Americas and in Africa during 1200 to 1450. Next time, Europe. Hey, thanks for... All righty, so um, let's just... If you, if we look at this here, um, I know this is a longer one, but this is 
basically Friday and Monday's content. If I if I post anything on Monday, it will be um, just stuff that might be helpful, not necessary to do or anything like that. Um, so no assignments or anything like that on Monday. So let's see if we had gotten to uh, uh, this just goes on about Islam. There's a good source about the Malacca Strait that I added on slide 19. This is uh, on slide 20. This is a picture of Tenochtitlan here, the Aztec capital. Um, like he was talking very briefly, like uh, 40 seconds or so about um, about the Cahokia and the American Indians. I don't think the American Indians are going to be this, that early American Indians are going to be on uh, a, a dbq question but if you click on this good chance they're gonna could bring up a reference the aztecs or the incas um so if you on slide 20 if you can click on this link it is going to take you to a chapter about the american indians central and south american indians and we want to go to this page and it's going to be so you're going to it's going to open up like this chapter 11 you want to go down to page page 377 and if you could read 377 to 379 I'll we'll ask you a few questions. Okay, let's pick it back up in the um, in this PDF, and let's go to section three. This is about the Incas. If you can go down, there's only like two pages I need to read, I believe, two or three. So from 384 to 385, so you can take about two minutes and read those pages. I'll ask you a few questions.